So let's prove the Bolzano virus stress theorem. Let's prove that every sequence has a convolution subsequence. And here's the logic that I'll use. I'll prove instead a different theorem called the monotone subsequence theorem, which, I mean, let's even fill in the blanks, says that if a sub n is any sequence, then there is a subsequence a sub n sub k of a sub n, which is, well, what do you think it should be? If it's the monotone subsequence theorem, what sort of subsequence do you think I want to construct? Monotone. A monotone one. That's all. So the general structure of, well, I don't want to say today, but the couple of pages that'll be the proof of the Balzano virus stress theorem is let's assume the monotone subsequence theorem and use that to conclude the Balzano virus stress theorem, and then we'll prove the monotone subsequence theorem using a really handy trick in terms of the language of peaks that a sequence might have. So let's prove Balzano virus stress assuming monotone, sub monotone subsequence theorem. So let's let x sub n be a bounded sequence. So let's let x of n be a sequence that's bounded. We want to show it has a convergent subsequence. By the monotone subsequence theorem, what can we conclude? What does monotone subsequence theorem say? There exists a monotone subsequence sequence. There's a monotone subsequence. By the monotone subsequence theorem, x of n has a monotone subsequence. Let's even give it a name. Variable name inconsistencies. So let's replace those x's with a sub n's. Just because it seems like I'm switching to a sub n's anyway. So let's see, the whole sequence a sub n is bounded. Um, does that mean that the subsequence should also be bounded? Yeah, right? Somehow, like every term of the subsequence should be a term of the big sequence, and so it should be bigger than the lower bound and less than an upper bound. So a sub n sub k is bounded. Well, one of the things we know about a sub n sub k right now, it is, well, by its very construction, it's bounded and monotone. Bounded monotone. Maybe we showed them the other one. That's OK. a sub n sub k is bounded, and it is monotone. So we have this theorem called the monotone convergence theorem, right? Uh, what does it say about this sequence a sub n sub k? It converges. So a sub n sub k is a convergence in the subsequence of a sub n, completing the proof. What do you think? Did that go okay? And that was actually like really easy. Um, but there was kind of a big black box that should be justified. I should actually tell you why the monotone subsequence theorem is true. So let's prove the monotone subsequence theorem. So the proof is going to hinge, so let's let a sub n be any sequence. There's no qualifier in the monotone subsequence theorem. Every sequence has a monotone subsequence. So it's the, the proof is going to involve a definition which will be entirely local to the proof. I will never refer to a peak ever again in this class after this proof. So let's let a sub n be a sequence. Some natural number p is called a peak for a sub n. Yeah, for every k bigger than p, it follows that a p is bigger than or equal to a k. So maybe it's worth saying that in words, p is a peak if a p is bigger than or equal to every term after. All right, so the thing in pink is like a more informal statement, which, while less formal, is maybe more intuitive as to what it's measuring. People feel okay about the definition? So there are going to be two cases in this proof. Either the sequence a sub n has infinitely many peaks, or the sequence a sub n has only finitely many peaks. Those are, one of those two things has to be true, right? I don't, there are infinitely many peaks that aren't. Um, case one, let's suppose there are infinitely many peaks. 
Let's just list them one at a time, peak one, peak two, peak three, peak four. Let's just list all the peaks. So here our PK is just the kth peak. What do you think? Is this going to solve as like the n sub k? Now let's just check that it can. Is that obviously strictly increasing? We've listed the peaks in all. Meaning that the kth peak happens before the uh, k plus fast or k plus one. Which, which one of those do you think we... Because I'm going to stick with one throughout the course, and I think this is the first time I've had to ask. What seems most natural? K plus fast or K plus one? K plus one. K plus one? OK. I've been told um, that no matter which choice I use by various people, it's the wrong choice. <laughs> um, the kth peak happens before the k plus 1, i.e. pk is less than pk plus 1. So a sub p sub k is a subsequence. But that's not good enough, right? It's not surprising that a sequence has a subsequence. Every sequence has a subsequence. That's not surprising. Um, what do we need to show about this particular subsequence to complete our proof? Well, it's the, proof, it's the monotone subsequence theorem. So this subsequence had better be monotone. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be monotone? Either increasing or decreasing. Either increasing or decreasing. So we need to show that this sequence is um, either increasing or decreasing. And let's figure out which by actually just trying to write the proof. And then we'll put what goes in that blank afterwards. So um, either way, you need to like consider an index k that's less than an index l and prove either pk is less than pl or pl is less than pk. Let's prove that. Let's prove one of those two. So let's see. Let's uh, do, 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 do. consider any k less than l. Let's see, pk is a peak, and pk is definitely less than pl, right? The lth peak happens after the kth peak because l is bigger than k. Um, well, let's see, pk is a peak, so what does that imply? Looking at the definition of a peak. Let's go to the margin. So let's see, pk is a peak means for every, I'll use a generic letter like q, bigger than p, a sub q is less than or equal to a sub p sub k. So let's see, um, how do PK and PL compare? Which one is bigger? PL, right? The L peak happens after the K peak because L is bigger than K. So can I take that Q and replace it with a P sub L? Sorry. Right? And I can make a conclusion. So since <clears throat> since PK is a peak and PK is less than PL, I can conclude something about A sub P sub K and A sub P sub L. What can I conclude? Maybe a 
picture helps. I will draw a picture. So I'm going to list the terms of a sequence. So there are some like dots indicating the height of the sequence. So there is A1, A2, A3, A4. So what it means to say that AP is a peak, that P is a peak, is that if there's this P value and you look for one, you never see any values for A above that line after that point. So let's just look at this picture as drawn. Look. That value. Is that a peak for the sequence? It looks like it, right? If you draw this line forward, it's bigger than everything after it. Is this point a peak for the sequence? Because yeah. if you draw that line forward, there's something after that value for p, for which a sub p is bigger than that. Is this a peak? I guess it depends on how I draw my line. It looks like there's a problem right there. Uh, what about this? Does that look like a peak? So that's what it means to be a peak. You are a peak if the y value at that index is bigger than every other y value you see in this graph. Yeah. So are we listing them in a reverse order then? Because otherwise this would always be decreasing, wouldn't it? Are decreasing sequences monotone? Yeah, we just... I thought it said, explain why this is a strictly increasing sequence. Ah, so PK needs to be strictly increasing. Mm -hmm. APK might okay. be decreasing. Okay. Yeah, so I, this is a peak, apparently a 2. So 2 is P1. Okay. You told me that this should be the next peak, so there's P2. Gotcha. So indeed, the PIs are increasing, but it looks like the Y values are getting smaller. And in fact, that's kind of exactly the proof, right? Since P1 is less than P2 and P1 is a peak, AP1 must be bigger than AP2. In general, since K is less than L, then PK must be less than PL. So since PK is a peak, APK must be bigger than or equal to a sub p sub l. People happy now? Yeah. So essentially the peaks are peaking ahead to see if anything's greater than. Yeah. So previously, like, until you made that pun, I found the name of these as peaks really kind of unsatisfying. Um, and uh, let's draw this sequence. Is this a peak for the sequence? Is this a peak for the sequence? Is this a peak for the sequence? That's kind of dissatisfying in terms of calling a thing a peak, but it's because of the pun. They only peak at that. That's nice. OK, cool, but back on track, back on track. So is this sequence a sub p sub k increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. But decreasing is a type of monotone. So we've completed the proof in the case that you have a sequence with infinitely many peaks. Do you think every sequence has infinitely many peaks? Probably not. In fact, maybe I'll draw an explicit example. So that's supposed to be like an increase in sequence. Is that a peak? Is that a peak? Are there any peaks? No. So there are sequences that have no peaks. So we do have to deal with the only finitely many peaks case. We can't just 
imagine that away. And we'll need some alternate proof. Instead of using the fact that there are infinitely many peaks, we'll need a proof that uses that there will only finitely many. And here's how we'll do it. Um, I mean, here's a, a thing that has no peaks. If you were to want to construct a monotone subsequence of this, what subsequence would you want to use? Just the sequence. The whole thing. It already looks like it's monotone. So somehow, if there are no peaks, maybe you can find something that increases. And let, let's do that. So let's uh, suppose that A sub n has only finitely many peaks. Um, so do you think we can find like a last peak? Yeah, finite sets are bounded. If you want to prove that, you can come up with a proof based on induction. So only a set containing only one thing is bounded. And if you add only one thing to a bounded set, you can probably show it's still bounded. Uh, finite sets are bounded. So there's some last peak. I'll call it P sub last. That's a good name for the last peak. It follows then that whenever you have an index after the last peak, could that thing possibly be a peak itself? Nope. Ah, but that tells us something. Let's negate the definition of a peak. We know something about this now. So maybe I'll write this down here. Not k is a peak. Let's translate what that means. So that means not for all, well, what letter did I use in the definition? Yeah, oh, well, k was the thing. For all l bigger than or equal to k, a l is less than or equal to a k. So I think I've just successfully negated the definition of a peak. Do I screw up any of the inequalities? For everything after the peak, the y value is less than or equal to y value. Okay, I think I've done it correctly. So let's just negate that, because that's what we know. So k is not a peak means, let's negate this. What do you get when you negate a universal statement? There exists. An existential statement. Right? If something is not true for everything, there must exist a counterexample. So we see that there exists an L bigger than or equal to k with that not being true. So what do you get when you negate a sub L is less than or equal to a sub k? A sub L is greater than a sub k. A sub L is greater than a sub k. There exists some number bigger than k. I'll call it x of k. So notice I did the same trick last time. I'm going to like pretend that this L depends on k, which it does. Uh, it's bigger than or oh, equal to k. Uh, no, I think I want strictly bigger than. I didn't use that in this. So I'm going to make that a strict inequality there. <clears throat> there exists something bigger than k, which satisfies that a sub x of k is bigger than a sub k. Nice. I'm going to use that to build a subsequence that's monotone. And here's how I will do it. I'll use recursion. So I'll, I'll restate that right here. So for all, whenever this k is bigger than p sub last, there exists some x of k bigger than k with a sub x of k bigger than a sub k. Cool. 
So that x of k notation is just emphasizing that this thing depends on the choice of k. Of course it does. And now I'm ready to construct this, this strictly increasing sequence. So I'll let the false form of the sequence just be something after that last peak. Because I want to pretend that there are no peaks. So I'll let k1 be the last peak plus 1. But since that k1 isn't a peak, there must be something after it that's bigger than it, because it's not a peak. But then there has to be something after that thing that's bigger than that thing that's also not a peak. And you can keep on going, and you'll get this sort of common relation. So let's set k1 to be 1 after the last peak, but let's set kn plus 1 to be x of kn. That definition make sense? Well, there's kind of a built-in assumption in that definition, isn't there? I can only take x of a thing if I know that that thing is itself not a peak. But I mean, that has to be true, right? Let's prove it. So let's prove using induction that none of these kn are peaks. So let's prove it. Um, the base case, so let's see, when n is equal to 1, k sub n well, is k sub 1. Oh, I guess I'm using the wrong notation. I'm using like k sub n instead of n sub k. Okay, it's okay with that? Okay. Well, what is the definition of k sub 1? It's like this, right? P sub last plus 1. Why is that not a peak? Because p last is the last peak. Since p last is the last peak, and k1 comes after p last, that's why that plus 1 is there. k1 is not a peak. So that means that k2 is defined. Because right, k2 is x of k1. So let's prove that none of these are peaks. Let's see, what's the definition of k sub n plus 1? x of kn. I need to show that that isn't a peak. But what do you know about x of kn? Um, I think that what I'm really going to prove here isn't that kn is not a peak. Let's prove that each kn is bigger than p last, and so it's not a peak. So let's do something more than just assuming kn is not a peak. Let's assume that kn is bigger than p last, and so is not a peak. So x of kn is bigger than kn. <coughs> Uh, what did I just write in orange that I want to assume about kn? It's bigger than p last. Well, hey, that just kind of proves it if the orange thing is what I actually want to prove. But does the orange statement imply that none of these kn's are peaks? Yeah, I think so. p last is the last peak. Yeah. Out of curiosity, why couldn't you just show that x of kn is an increasing function? Well, I guess in some sense we just did. Ah, OK, but you can't even talk about what's the domain of this x? x of kn isn't even defined unless I know that k is not a peak. x of kn isn't defined unless I know that kn is not a peak. So in order for you to justify this definition, you need to know that none of these k's are peaks. But in some sense, we did just prove that x is increasing. 
Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, the main subtlety here is in order for the cost of step two even makes sense, you need to know that tan isn't a peak. Cool. But as you said, this tan is now like automatically an increasing sequence. Let's explain why. So kn plus 1 is exactly x of kn, which is bigger than kn by the definition of x. So kn plus 1 is bigger than kn for all n in n. Which is exactly what you just said, right? So that means that this is a strictly increasing sequence. That's nice. Um, now let's just try to argue why a sub k sub n should be monotone, either increasing or decreasing. And maybe we'll try to figure out the proof on the board before we even write the statement. Or unless you guys are already, what do you think? Is this sequence going to be increasing or decreasing? How many people want it to be increasing? Anyone want it to be decreasing? Well, let's see. So remember, this is the definition. This is the statement which provides this function x that we're using. So let's try to prove that a sub kn, I'm not going to be so bold as to write it, but more hands went up for increasing, so let's hope for that. Consider any natural number n. I need to show that a sub k sub n um, I guess if we want it to be increasing, we want to show that, or maybe equal to. Let's see, k sub n plus 1 by its very definition is x of kn. So that means a sub k sub n plus 1 by substitution is the same thing as a sub x of kn. I guess it's written on orange, but it's slightly above the screen right now. A of x sub k is strictly bigger than a sub k. So a sub x sub kn must be strictly bigger than a sub kn. So let's just put that all in one line. I've got the space. a sub k sub n plus 1 is strictly bigger than a sub k sub n. Is this sequence increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Increasing, it looks like. Ooh. Pick it up later. Cool. And this completes the proof. Well, well, maybe let's talk about it. Does this actually complete the proof of the monotone subsequence theorem? Did we consider any sequence? And there were like two cases, and there weren't really many peaks or not. In both of those cases, did we construct a subsequence? And was that subsequence monotone? Yeah. Do you think there might be some sequences that have both increasing subsequences and decreasing subsequences? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll give you one, and this is a trick that we'll do at some point during the class. If I have like two different sequences, do you think I could just like shuffle together the terms of the sequence? The two different sequences? Like, what if I take like one over n, that's like a decreasing sequence, uh, and b sub n uh, minus one over n, that's increasing. And what if I just like shuffle these two together? Be like 1 over 1, negative 1 over 2, 1 over 3, negative 1 over 4. How would you want to construct a, pick your favorite, increasing or decreasing subsequence of that? What if you only take the odd terms? 
Then do you get increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. Decreasing, I think. What if you take only the even toys? Increasing. Increasing. So yeah, you can have both going on. Nice. Even in the case of a convergent sequence. This converges to zero, I think. Cool. So before I move on and start talking about a new thing, people have any questions about this proof and how it went? Cool. And it involved a trick that we've seen before where you use some notion to say that, aha, given any k, I can find like a next term that has similar behavior. That'll happen again in the lecture which will be connected to what I'm going to start doing now. I don't think I can get to it. Well, we'll see how far I get in 15 minutes. So, what do we have right now? We know that if I give you any bounded sequence, there exists a convolution subsequence, and I know that because there exists a monogen subsequence. I would like to prove some things about the set of all subsequential limits. And that's what we'll start doing here. So let's just recall the Balzano virus stress theorem, which says let a sub n, eh, I'm going to say x sub n now, be a sequence. Then x sub n has a convergent subsequence. Uh, remind me. What? Oh, you couldn't see any of that. Let's recall a definition. Given a sequence x sub n, what is a number x is called a subsequential limit of x sub n if what? What do you think it should mean? There's some some subsequence of x of n such that when it that subsequence is the subsequence of one Yeah. It's not to find a term in terms of itself. But. I mean, you said the limit of that subsequence at some point, right? Yeah. yeah, that's all it means. You take a subsequence, you take a limit, that's a subsequential limit. A number is a subsequential limit of x of n if, for some subsequence, x sub n sub k, x is equal to the limit of x sub n sub k. And maybe to be a little bit clearer, I'll make, I'll say explicitly, it's the limit as k goes to infinity. Which, of course, it, it, like you can look at it and see it has to be. k is the only independent variable there. Well, but let's parse this out a little bit. Um, x, let's suppose that, well, I want to start setting the set of all subsequential limits. And here's a result that is very easy to show. Let x of n be a bounded se sequence. Um, I'll use blackboard bold L throughout to denote sets of subsequential limits. So let's let blackboard bold L be the set of all subsequential limits of x of n. Then that set, blackboard bold L, containing all the subsequential limits of x of n, is both non-empty and bounded. And maybe before we even proceed, um, what do you think I'm going to do as soon as I prove that a set is non-empty and bounded? What do I know about sets that are non-empty and bounded? Say above. A set is non-empty and it has an upper bound and it has a supremum. A supremum. Or at least upper bound if you don't like the Latin. So that's what I'll do as soon as we get to the next page and prove this, prove this result. But let's prove this thing. It's not going to be heard. Let's prove that black, if x of n is a bounded sequence, then the set of all subsequential limits is non-empty and bounded. So let's let x of n be a bounded sequence. Let's let blackboard bold L be the set of all subsequential limits. I need to show that blackboard bold L is non-empty. To do that, I just need to find an element of blackboard bold L. So I need to show that there exists a subsequential limit. And before we actually write the proof, let's maybe come up with an informal proof. What do I know about x sub n because it's bounded? Which is the Balsam of 
Judge Garcia would say? There exists a uh, subsequence that converges. There exists a subsequence that converges. Do limits of convergent subsequences exist? All right, that's what it means to be convergent. The limit exists. So what do you think? Is the limit of that particular convergent subsequence a subsequential limit? Does that show that black hole hell has an element? Yeah, great. Let's just write that now. So since x sub n is a bounded sequence, I can use the bolzano weierstrass theorem to see that x sub n has a convergent subsequence. And I'm not sure I need to refer to it at any point in the immediate future, but let's give it a name x sub n sub k. That convergent sequence, being a convergent sequence, has a limit. Let's let x be that limit. Well, hey, then x is a subsequent limit of the original sequence x sub n. It's literally a limit of a subsequence. That's always a black hole down. Since l has at least one element, it is not empty. Cool. That seems to be okay. Let's also prove that it's bounded. Let's prove that black hole ball L is a bounded set. Now remember, X of N is bounded. Since it's bounded, it has an upper bound, let's call it U, and a lower bound, let's call it little L. What do you think are some good choices to maybe be bounds on the set of all subsequential limits? Yeah, if every term of the sequence is less than or maybe equal to at u, could a limit of that sequence be bigger than u? No, we even have like some limit laws that I think we can use. So, do to do to do to do. Claim u is an upper bound on blackboard bold L, and little l is a lower bound on blackboard bold L. Let's see why that claim is true. And let's just think about this even in terms of correct formatting of a boundedness proof. A set is bounded by these numbers if everything in the set is less than u but bigger than l. No, less than or equal to u and bigger than or equal to l. Less than or equal to is just fine for bounds. So I need to prove something about every element of the set. Let's consider any element of the set. Let's let x be in blackboard bold l. And then let's just chase definitions. What does it mean to be in blackboard bold l? That's the definition of blackboard bold L. It's the set of all subsequential limits. So if x is in L, then x is a subsequential limit of the original sequence xn. Uh, what does it mean to be a subsequential limit? There exists a subsequence that converges. There exists a subsequence, say x sub n sub k such that limit of x sub n sub k is equal to x. We called this thing x. Well, since u and l are bounds, we have that for every natural number n, l is less than or equal to u sub n is less than or equal to u. But I don't care about every n right now. I only care about the n sub k's. Do people buy that that's true? OK, good, right? n sub k is a natural number. And you know that inequality for every natural number n. Well, wait, can I just take the limit of that inequality? Yeah, in particular, because this limit exists, I can appeal to that limit law. So l is less than or equal to the limit of x sub n sub k is less than or equal to u. So l is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to u. So u is an upper bound, l is a lower bound. So we're done. Nice. We're pretty happy. But now we get to the point of today, and I have five minutes to do some exploration of it. Since l is non-empty, 
and bounded. Um, it's bounded above and below, but maybe I'll emphasize the one above for now. And I guess you've already told me what I'm about to say. Since L is not empty and bounded above, the completeness of R says that. L has a simply one. Oh goodness, the supremum is the least upper bound. If you prefer love or WhatsApp, go for it. So that turns out to be an important, um, uh, the existence of that thing turns out to be pretty important. I'm going to make the following definite. Let, let's let x of n be a bounded sequence. Blackboard bold L is a set of all subsequential limits of x of n. Then the limit superior of x of n, which I will denote as lim sup of x of n. The textbook will denote it by lim with a little line drawn on top of the lim. Is the supremum of the set of all subsequential limits. That definition make sense? Now. I don't know. So maybe I'll assault, state this as something that m might be unsatisfying about this is the definition of the lim soup. If you read that out, that's like the supremum of all of the limits. So shouldn't that be the soup lim? If you're actually bothered by that, then the final project poster today is one that is appropriate for you. You will instead construct this object as a limit of a sequence of suprema. The limit inferior of Xn, denoted liminf, or lim with a little line below it, is the infimum of blackboard bold L. How do you guys feel about that? I mean, it's a definition. Um, We'll get some mileage out of thinking about it. Probably not today. I have four minutes and probably shouldn't go over more today. There's something important happening right after this, this class. Maybe I'll just say this. Lim sup of Xn is definitely not the same as the supremum of the set of the tons of Xn. And let's just see why that's true by example, I guess. Sometimes it is, not often. Let's think about xn equal to 1 over n. Uh, what's the limit of that sequence? Zero. Zero. So what is the limit of any subsequence of that sequence? Also zero. If a sequence converges, then all its subsequences converge to that same number. So what is the set of all subsequential limits of that set equal to? Zero. Well, it's equal to the set containing only zero. I don't think anyone's been guilty of that. Has anyone uh, in any of the things they've written conflated those two objects? OK, good. They are different. Uh, has anyone conflated these two objects? Because those are two different things. This is a set containing a single thing, namely the empty set. And that is the set containing no things. So they're, di they're different. Um, but I, sorry, that's a tangent. Um, so let's see, out of that, um, tell me, what is the limb soup of this sequence? What is the limb soup of accent? What's the supremum of the set containing only zero? zero. The limb soup is zero. Awesome. On the other hand, tell me, what is the supremum of the set containing all of the forms of the sequence? What is the supremum of 1 comma 1 half comma 1 third comma 1 fourth and so on? One. Are those the same? Good. In fact, um, maybe there's something you noticed here. 
if you have a sequence that actually converges to some number, then the set of all subsequential limbs should be like the set containing that number. And so the limb sup and limb in should both just be that number. In fact, the converse is also true. I'm going to say this theorem, and then I'm going to shut up because I'm out of time. Let xn be a bounded sequence. Then limb sup of xn is equal to limb inf of xn is equal to some number l, if and only if xn actually converges to l. So limb sup and limb inf encode convergence in their definitions. But I'm going to stop there. We'll pick this up on Monday. And this time, I'm actually going to remember to hit stop record.